Sea Keeping. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. I had the opportunity to give a presentation to the Pakistan Naval Engineering College. No fancy math, just a simple overview of the science, structure, and process of sea keeping. I've then taken that video lecture and broken it up into several easy to digest YouTube videos. So let's dive into the subject of sea keeping. It's time to wrap up this video series with a question and answer session. The students at Pakistan Naval Engineering College created some great questions in response to this video lecture. In part six, I try to answer some of those questions. I often tell people that sea keeping is a game of luck with all of the mathematics that we deal with. We have all of the probabilities and statistics and all of these analyses still have as their output the possibility of just encountering random bad luck. That's the nature of ships and of the sea is just having random bad luck. As I said at the beginning, there's always the risk of encountering a storm. Anytime we go to sea, we are risking the safety of the ships and frankly, the safety of our lives. Throughout history, we have looked and searched for tools to improve the odds, to reduce the risk to the ship. And I'm happy to say that sea keeping is one of those tools. It can't provide us absolute answers, but it can ensure that the odds of success and the odds of safety are stacked very heavily in our favor. Thank you very much. Uh, let's now open this up to some questions. Okay, I'll start with one from was asking which software is best for carrying out CFD analysis for ship sea keeping and how accurate is it when compared to actual test results? So I would say that the best software that I have encountered is one called OrcaFlex. Um, it's from a company named Orkina out of the UK. They are probably the best in terms of the mathematics involved and the interface they provide. How accurate is it? Uh, I would say about plus or minus 3% error to plus or minus 15% error. And the trouble with all the numerical software is that it doesn't come with a manual telling you the process for seakeeping analysis. So you still have to get the mathematics correct and provide the right inputs to the software. And that's where a lot of the variability comes in um, compared to experimental testing. Experimental testing is a lot nicer because it provides a, a, a much better direct feedback about any problems that you might be encountering. One thing I would want to say about CFD and numerical analysis in general, the main problem with numerical analysis for seakeeping is garbage in versus garbage out. You really need to know um, exactly all of the science behind the program to make sure that you're describing the right inputs. Uh, a great example for this that I'll describe is uh, roll damping. Uh, that added damping for roll is a very critical input for many of these sea keeping programs, but on the program, it's just a field that you type in a number. There, there's no text on the program to tell you that this is a very critical number and will completely alter the results of your analysis. You just have to know that. So that, that's one of the results. And I think that's one of the reasons that we get a lot of questions for accuracy in any sort of numerical analysis. There is a general problem of some people using the software without knowing how to use it accurate, accurately. How accurate is our mathematical model of sea waves? That one is very accurate. Uh, because we have multiple models to account for those interactions. So yeah, that one within the limits of statistics is very, very accurate. I've even seen some research coming out of the American Bureau of Shipping that's now trying to predict um, what we would call rogue waves. Um, that's now finding out that rogue waves, they're not a separate physical event from regular waves. It's now looking at them as the possibility of actually saying that even though having all of those waves stacking on top of each other to produce that 
one in 10 million probability. Um, that's what that statistical analysis is looking at, is saying that, well, the rogue wave is that one event where that's that one in 10 million chance. Oh, here's one that I really like actually, asking about computational and non-computational commercial softwares to predict seakeeping characteristics in the early design stage. So numerical analysis, we were talking about options of strip theory, panel code, and RANS. Uh, RANS is CFD, Reynolds Average, Navy, or Stokes. So talking about the early design stage, typically you're going to want something that's using strip theory. Uh, strip theory codes are very cheap computationally. Uh, you can literally click the button and have the entire computation done in about two seconds. So some examples of strip theory codes, two that I know, uh, you have from a company called Bentley, uh, MaxSurf Seakeeper, I believe is the name. They have one option. And then also um, another company called Creative Systems. They make a program called GHS. That also is one that has um, seakeeping predictions in there as well. GHS is very nice because it also does stability analysis. Uh, they started out with stability analysis and added C keeping in as their capability. So those are both programs that I would use for the early design stage. Another question about how accurately can you predict C keeping characteristics using experimental techniques? Very accurately, um, plus or minus 2% error or less. The statement that I will say for that is if you want it, uh, accurate C keeping prediction is very possible. The question is generally paying for it. Uh, a lot of the techniques that I've described are not cheap and they're not easy. And that generally translates into a larger budget. So that's where people start to look at uh, lesser techniques. Generally, I will recommend a phased approach where you start with the cheaper techniques and iterate through them. Or once you're pretty close to your final solution, that's when you'll go to the more expensive techniques. Oh, here's a good one. And what is the relative importance of seat keeping in designing the ship as compared to other core fields like stability, resistance, and maneuvering? That's a great question. Based upon the work that I've done with all of my clients, seat keeping is not essential to the ship design. Uh, there are many times when the clients just want to produce the ship and accept whatever the seat keeping is. Generally, the way we work with that is we will build ships that are very close in design to previous successful designs. And this is one of the ways that we can work effect effectively with sea keeping and with ship design is rather than doing all of the analysis, we work from our empirical experience of previous generations of ships. If we know something has worked on another ship, it's safe to say that as long as you copy the details pretty closely, it's going to work again on the on a, a new ship. Ooh, here's a really good one that I like. Can we predict the seakeeping of any ship by looking at its form and parameters? Generally, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the one catch is the information required for predicting seakeeping is a lot more extensive than you normally find in your average ship design. We often, in seakeeping analysis, we have to make a lot of estimates and guesses. And that's where a lot of the problems start to come in in the inaccuracies. Oh, here's a great one. Uh, somebody asked, what should be the significant wave height for a seakeeping analysis? That's what you'll get from the wave buoy data or from any of that geographic data. Um, so if you were to actually go look at a NOAA wave buoy uh, and look at the, the columns of data that it writes out, it will actually specify the significant wave height. That, that is one of the data points that it writes out. Now, you then start to ask the question, well, this is wave buoy data for 30 years. So which point in those 30 years do you take the significant wave height for? Uh, generally, if you're looking at a region for engineering purposes, you'll probably pick the upper end of the available wave heights within a region. Uh, 90th or 95th percentile is a pretty typical level that you would go to. How does the response to given sea conditions vary by a given or by a given hull type, how do those vary? That's a good question. Uh, so looking at the different hull types, generally I would compare between multi-body and mono hulls. Multi-body hulls are going to have much less of a roll response. 
Uh, they're going to be much more level on a C state. However, as a result of that, you're also going to get much faster accelerations in a multi-body hull. Uh, so anything like a catamaran or a trimaran, those produce much faster accelerations. Now, a monohull, on the other hand, monohulls are what we all know as being much nicer. They're, they're large displacement vessels, typically. Uh, that extra displacement, that extra mass, does a lot to slow down your ship motions, so that's very useful. But the weak point for a monohull is you get large roll motions. And so reducing roll is a, a generally a major point of focus when you're looking at sea keeping for a monohull. The final hull type that I would look at is something called a swath hull. That's sort of like a catamaran, though it's specifically designed to reduce sea keeping motions. Uh, I actually did a whole YouTube video on that if you want to find more details on it. But the limit of a swath hull is that it's very stable. It does not respond to ocean waves, which is perfectly fine up to the point when the waves are larger than the hull. So that's one of the challenges for a swath is making sure that it still has some response. How do we minimize the torque generated through the six motions? Ooh, that's a good one. So I think that one is asking about um, torsion of the ship's hull and longitudinal bending. That's a really big question for fluid structure interaction. The simplest answer I can give for that of how to minimize the torque is um, don't build as big of a ship. The, unfortunately, the, the, the larger ship that you have, um, the larger the structural impact on that, the larger area that you have for torque. Uh, so that's generally just something that you have to live with as a consequence of building larger ships. And then the result, the question more becomes how to accurately predict that torque and make sure that you have a structural design for it. Though I will say, considering that torque from ship motions, that is something really important when you're considering the initial selection of your hull form. So for example, if we look at a catamaran versus a mono hull, uh, there are actually quite a few additional forces that we would have to look at for a catamaran, specifically related to torque between the two hulls. Mm. How can we predict shoreline change in the future? That's, um, <clears throat> That's an excellent question. And honestly, the interaction between the shoreline and the ocean waves is getting more into um, what I would call the civil engineering field. There's a book published by the, I believe it's the Army Corps of Engineers. It's like the Coastal Protection Manual, uh, but they have some pretty good models for predicting shoreline change as the result of uh, ocean waves. Please highlight some ongoing research areas related to sea keeping. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, so one thing that I would say that's definitely an ongoing research is um, ocean wave energy, which is sort of the um, dream from sea keeping analysis. Extracting electricity and energy from the ocean waves has been something that we have been trying to do for the, since about 1970, and we are still working on it. Uh, there are no real commercial installations for ocean wave energy yet. Uh, and the, the general problem with it is a getting enough energy out to make it economically viable, but also B is survival of the buoys. To get the most energy out, you generally want to place your wave energy device in the worst wave conditions imaginable. You want to specifically find the worst conditions on the planet and say, this is where I'm going to put my device. Getting your device to then survive the worst wave conditions on the planet is pretty difficult. Uh, another example, there is one that I've seen specifically that has to do with a new numerical technique in the offshore industry where you have a um, fixed oil platform and you're trying to model the interactions of the ocean waves with that using RANS. Now, the problem with that is that you actually need a, a very large physical space uh, in your computer. And that's what we would call a large domain. Or to accurately capture the wave interactions of that single oil platform, you need to model a space that's probably about one nautical mile around that. And that can be extremely computationally intensive. 
you end up spending a lot of computing power um, for areas that are just open ocean. So one area of ongoing research that I saw is combining a hybrid approach where it just uses RANs in the, say, 200 meters around the oil platform. Uh, RANs is the expensive math, and then it will actually switch to using uh, panel coves and potential theory for the remaining region. And so that's one of those areas. A lot of what we're doing in for ongoing sea keeping research, in, especially in the numerical end, I would say is trying to find uh, more economic methods for sea keeping analysis. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe for more videos. And did you know that we produce more than just videos at DMS? Check out our website to find more articles, free downloads, and other help with ship design. We offer a host of engineering services for budgets large and small. So check us out to see if we can make your next project easier.